I can still remember the first melody I've heard in my life as a baby. It was Brahms. Sometimes I think it was him who awakened my love for music so much that I just had to become a musician. Johann Jakob Brahms, the father of Johannes, was a musician and he played double bass. But he was probably not the most skillful player because he claimed it could be only a matter of pure coincidence to play more than two consecutive tones and to stay in tune. Brahms unfortunately never forgot that and he never dared to compose a piece for double bass, not even a chamber music piece. But he learned, still in his childhood, the importance of the lowest voice and all his scores, no matter is it a symphony or just a piano solo piece, they have fantastic sounding lowest voice, which often has its own line, like a melody. to many colleagues, musicians, about Brahms and I've noticed that quite many of them consider his music as something totally special, beyond any category, almost as something sacred. And I feel similarly about this composer. I think I would never dare to play a piece by Brahms if I wasn't totally convinced it sounds just the way Brahms should sound like. His music is so deep and it never has superficial effects.
I'm sitting here exactly at the place where Brahms composed his sonata in A major, opus 100. I came to this place often when I was learning that sonata, just to feel this landscape which Brahms could also see from his window. There is an old photo of Brahms. He's sitting on the bench. And I always like to imagine I came here to sit on the same bench. But it's not true, because exactly here was the house where Brahms stayed. It was demolished in 1932 when the road had to be enlarged. And this memorial reminds of the house where Brahms composed Brahms just loved to spend his free time in the nature and he preferred countryside vacations. He came three years in a row to the charming little city Thun in Switzerland. First year when he came, it was 1886, he was visited by several good friends and he was especially delighted that a singer, Hermine Spies, will come to visit him that summer. So he wanted to impress her. He was slightly enamored by her then. And uh, he composed several songs with very romantic lyrics. And the songs should fit her very low contra-alto voice. At the same time, he was also composing this sonata in A major, opus 100. And that is maybe the reason why this sonata is so full of the melodies and romantic motives. He was using the motifs from those songs in the sonata. This sonata just sounds like poetry.
Brahms was so happy to be in tune and he was very inspired to compose. When his friends came to visit him, he told them as a joke, of course, that they should be very careful when they come because the area is just so full of melodies that they have to take care not to step on any. I think one can feel in this sonata in A major how happy he was. It is just such a lyrical piece. And I find particularly interesting the form of the second movement in this sonata because it is a combination of a slow movement which appears three times and a scherzo which appears twice, always in between.
is no single major composition for double bass, like a sonata or a concerto written by the greatest composers, the real romantic giants. And when I was just beginning to play double bass, I thought how it must be incredible feeling. I was dreaming about playing once such a piece by some great composer like Brahms. And it was indeed an extraordinary experience and very powerful feeling to perform Brahms. And after this first sonata in A major, I wanted to play more by Brahms. The next sonata I've learned was totally different in its musical content. It was a gritty, melancholic piece with a very mournful character and huge contrasts. Brahms was still totally unknown when he was 20 years old. He was insecure about the potential of his talent and he was even considering to drop the plans of getting a musician. His friend Josef Joachim, the violinist who later became legendary, heard about that from Brahms and he advised Brahms to go to Düsseldorf to show his works to the famous composer Robert Schumann. Brahms was nervous, even awe-stricken, before knocking at the door of the Schumanns. But it was not only because of Robert Schumann. It was also because of his wife, Clara, who was a very famous pianist and a real superstar already at that time. And Brahms was a huge admirer of Robert Schumann and his composing, which had very big influence on Brahms in his younger years. Robert Schumann recognized instantly how huge the talent of Johannes Brahms was and he encouraged him a lot. He also liked the character of that young man and uh, Brahms stayed in their home for longer than one month and these three people became friends for their lifetimes. Robert Schumann helped a lot. He contacted the greatest publishers of that time and uh, talked in public about the rising star, Johannes Brahms the composer. And one more thing has happened. Not long after that, Clara Schumann and Johannes Brahms started falling in love with each other. But at the end they couldn't be together as a couple. Brahms suffered a lot because of the circumstances and he discharged his energy in a creative way, by composing. The sonata in E minor, opus 38, is actually a story about two people who cannot be together as a couple. The two instruments in this sonata are playing almost all the time 
apart. And here, from this moment on, Brahms used even more of musical symbolisms. He started quoting Schumann and his specific musical language. Schumann used descending fifths as an expression of joy in his compositions. Brahms and Clara Schumann were happy because they knew they will remain friends. But because they are not a couple, the two instruments were playing now descending fifths apart. The next musical symbolism Brahms used right after this is the descending horn signal. And that is traditionally musical symbol for farewell and symbolizes the farewell of the idea that they would get together as a couple. But the instruments are playing this time unisono, because this decision was mutual, so they played it together. Yes, I was analyzing a lot the substance of these pieces. Otherwise, it would be impossible to understand the meaning of all those symbols. And as an artist, I think the right proportions for the dynamics or to choose the right tempo or the articulations are in combination the key to interpret every profound piece. And I wanted to reach 
its deepest content. It would be such a waste not to use a full potential of such a fantastic music. And I have read a couple of books about the lives of all those three fantastic characters. And at the end, I could put the puzzles together and start to learn the piece. I've chosen a perfect location to record my Brahms album. It was in this peaceful music church with excellent acoustics, not far from tune. But I had to solve the biggest problem years before scheduling the recording. The double bass just didn't sound clear enough to me. Not for Brahms sonatas. And it was already a bit annoying with the sonata in A major. And it got much worse with the E minor sonata because it has more massive piano parts. And I was thinking a lot how to solve that problem, because double bass has actually a big tone volume and it is so rich of overtones, I was sure it was possible to solve it. And then I've got an idea to use a higher string. It is an old trick, which was actually commonly used in Baroque with violones. The effect was fantastic.
this sound comparison was recorded with professional microphones from the short distance. The difference is even much bigger the way how human hearing perceives the sound when sitting in the concert hall. This extra clarity made the instrument on the distance much better understandable. And finally there was a new possibility to use all my strings and a variety of sound colors I didn't have when I was forced to play almost all the time only on the top string. And there was also that very important double stop place in the first movement, which was unplayable with the popular so-called solo tuning, and now it was very easily possible to perform it. <laughs> So at that point, after nearly 10 years of playing Brahms and after performing the sonatas several times in the concerts, after knowing the benefits of the higher tuning, I just had no other choice but to start to learn them again. Brahms just had to sound like Brahms should sound and I could not accept a compromise with such important thing like the sound. The perfectionism has sometimes its price. sentimental sounds of this movement were mainly composed in this old little hotel in Baden-Baden, Germany. This house also doesn't exist in its original form anymore. Brahms felt much better meanwhile about Clara and he regained full motivation and he wanted to complete this sonata and he composed one more movement, the final one. It is a powerful fugue and this was actually very suitable form to complete a piece where the instruments shouldn't play their melodies together. And this was the fourth movement of the sonata. Just when Brahms sent the manuscripts to his publisher, they found only three movements left. Brahms, meanwhile, decided to destroy one of the movements. The reason is unknown. It is just one another secret by Brahms, who didn't want us to know just everything. 
tuning unleashed totally new possibilities and now I was attracted by an idea to record an album with only Brahms sonatas and it was very motivating I've just needed a third sonata by Brahms but this time I didn't have to search for a long time because my heart belonged just to one and only one it was the last sonata he managed to compose during his lifetime. It was artistically absolute culmination of my whole project and that is possibly the most beautiful piece I have ever played.
turned 57, he felt tired of composing and he decided to quit. But shortly after, he met the clarinetist Richard Mühlfeld. Brahms was deeply impressed by his playing and he described it as the most beautiful clarinet sound he ever heard in his life. He changed his mind and started to compose again pieces for Mühlfeld. He composed a clarinet trio and a clarinet quintet and two sonatas, opus 120. That was the most magic meeting between a musician and a composer in entire music history, perhaps. And if Brahms himself hasn't written that arrangement for viola, which is an instrument that sounds quite differently than the clarinet, I think I wouldn't dare to make all this project. And that encouraged me to try to make a version for double bass. Maybe Brahms would have liked himself how it sounds. Once, when British pianist Fanny Davis asked for permission to arrange some music. Brahms should have answered, do whatever you wish, but please just do it beautifully. <laughs> And in the end, I think I know who would be the proudest and happiest person in the world. 
could he listen my album Double Bass Goes Brahms. Johann Jakob Brahms, the father. And I had to go once also to that place where it all began, to the cheap area of Hamburg of that time, to the place where the house once stood, where Johannes Brahms was born and where he grew up. That house also doesn't exist anymore. There is just a little memorial. But the music by Brahms will last longer than any house around us and it will outlive all of us. His music is just all around, just like the nature that he loved so much. And perhaps the nature and the music by Brahms are actually just part of each other. <laughs> 